topic the Lord laid on my heart this morning is the purpose of Christianity. The purpose of Christianity. Thank you, Jesus. John 3.16, again, we, we, it's such, such, you know, you, you, you could spend, I don't even know how long, I guess a year. You can just keep going back to John 3.16 because it connects to so much. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, it connects to the fact that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I mean, there's so, it's, it's such a tight web just from that one passage of scripture. And Jesus wanted his disciples to understand why is it that he came at that moment in time. What makes him the Messiah and not just the son of God? Because you see, titles matter. Jesus could be the son of God, but not the Messiah. I know it sounds crazy to say that, but it's true. He could be the son of God and not the Messiah, but he is the son of God and he is the Messiah. And the Messiah portion of it, you see, the son of God portion, let me go to that first. The son of God portion really has to deal with just who he is, his full power, his full righteousness, his full, his full divinity, his, his, um, his omnipresence, his uh, omnipotence, his, 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 you know, his, his all-knowing. I, I, the, 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 I'm running out of words, sorry. Because it's it's uh, trying to describe Jesus in totality is describing God in totality. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm running, I'm running out of words when you really try to quantify to some degree the, all, uh, the matchless power of Jesus. And, and so that's who he really, really is. And... Uh, when, but when we talk about him being the Messiah, the Messiah portion is what he came down and did on Calvary's hill. The Messiah portion is the foundation of Christianity because Christianity did not exist until Jesus really came onto the scene. And as he says that I don't come to, uh, uh, to condemn the law, but I come to fulfill the law. I'm completing that old covenant that was made to Abraham and showing you the fullness uh, of what God has in store for both Jew and Gentile. That's what, that's what being his, the Messiah means. Uh, he came down to save the whole world uh, from itself. He came down down to rectify or give people the opportunity to rectify themselves with God. That's why he be call him the Messiah. That's why Jesus means so much to us because we understand the sacrifice or at least we understand some level of the sacrifice that he made for us. So the purpose, like, like it says in Romans, the carnal mind is at, em, at enmity, I always say the wrong word, with God. And the issue that we're having today, not in the world, but in the church, is that the purpose of Christianity is being altered. It is preached altered. It is now taught altered. No longer is it just simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And as long as you keep on believing every single day, you will stay saved. We have now begun to add or take away things to suit our needs. Or what we believe that we need. To suit our desires. The, 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 the Christianity in and of itself when we really, really look at it properly, it's picking a side. You see, the worldview of Christians, of Christians, sorry, of Christians, the worldview of Christians is that we should be nice people. We should love everybody. We should not say a bad word about anybody. And when I say a bad, when I, let me clarify, when I say, say a bad word, I'm, we're not talking about cursing and using derogatory terms and using, you know, uh, um, hurtful vocabulary. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about no constructive criticism, no edifying, no correction, because we're supposed to be nice people. We're supposed to go along with the flow. I promise you this, had Jesus done that, he would have never died. Check out the Bible. 
Read the four Gospels. If Jesus was super, super nice, never rubbed um, anyone's shoulder, never got on anybody's nerves, he would have never have died. As a matter of fact, in order to die, he would probably have to commit suicide. Because the reason why, not, yes, he came to die, but the reason why he really ended up dying was because people were mad at him. The Pharisees were mad at him. Everybody was mad at him. I mean, Jesus is just born. Think, think about it for a second. He's just born. He hasn't preached a word yet. I don't need, all he's saying is good and God. What babies, babies, what they more as they make. And King Herod wanted to kill him. He hadn't even done nothing yet. He's just being a baby. He just came onto the scene. He's just born. Hadn't said nothing to nobody. Hadn't done nothing to anyone. Nothing of the sort like that. He is, like we say, children are innocent. This is one time for sure Jesus is truly innocent. He hasn't even said mama, dada. He hasn't, he hasn't decided what food he likes, what food he doesn't like. Uh, none of that has come onto the scene. And yet Herod wanted to kill him. From birth. Already Herod wants to kill him. And so many other children died because Herod wanted to kill him. And yet he did nothing. Literally has done nothing. No preaching of the word. No expounding. No miracles. No healing. No nothing at all. He was just simply born. And once Herod heard that Jesus was born because he studied the scriptures... And you would think somebody that studied the scriptures would be happy that Jesus is born. Or would be like, yes, this is the Messiah. He's thinking about himself because he wants to, quote, unquote, live forever. He's thinking about himself. So he sees Jesus not as the Messiah, but as a threat. Just his birth alone. And he went after and attempted to kill him. Thank God Joseph listened to the angel and left. Thank God the three wise men listened to the angel and never went back to Herod and told him exactly where they found Jesus. Gee, so this, the, there's this idea, really, really strong idea, that we're supposed to be docile and that we should constantly keep adjusting our beliefs and our faiths according to the whims of the world. And it's okay for the world to feel that way. It is. We need to, again, we need to understand the world is at enmity with God. They're living in darkness. They cannot see that which we can see in this newness of light and this newness of life. They can't see it. So I always say to people, you know, it, it, it doesn't really bother me too, too much. It might concern me because I do live in this world and we all want a better world, right? You know, I do live in this, so things do concern me, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, send me over the top because I'm like, I get it. You're living in sin. I get it. You're completely living in sin, like completely living in sin. So any type of crazy idea or thing that you kind of quantify in your mind to say this can work and it's against God, I'm not too surprised. It happened in the Old Testament. It happened in the New Testament. It happened, you know, um, in, in Roman times, happened in the Greek times, it happened in the Middle Ages, it happened in the Dark Ages, it happened at an in the Industrial Revolution, it happened in World War I, it happened in World War II, it happened in our very own Civil War, it happened in Vietnam, Korea, and I'm just naming different historical periods. No matter what, no matter what historical period you want to choose, man without God we, we do what we want to do. So I'm not, and we ought to have that kind of mindset where we don't go over the top when we see certain things. It might surprise us, don't get me wrong. Like, there are moments we are surprised. I'm surprised too. But the idea is that, like, they're the world. Like, even if you're surprised, it, just take a step back and be like, okay, they're the world. That's what they're going to do. And the only reason why we do different is because we're living in light. And God points us in a new direction. And therefore, we see things differently. Yeah. Think about children. When I was young, I said, I'm never going to force my kids to wash no dishes. Oh, yeah. Because when you live in 
my house and it's late Saturday night and I want to go relax in bed and you have all the pots and all the plates and everything's sitting in there. Or what used to grieve me even more is that I'm in the middle of washing and I'm not going to name no names but somebody would show up with a late night snack just finished and put it into the sink. And then have the nurse to tell me, God bless you, and walk away. So I can't even say nothing, really. Because the person is sending God's blessings toward me. <laughs> we got a dishwasher. I can't use it. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to throw in the dishwasher. No. And to be honest with you, certain things you honestly cannot put into the dishwasher. Like certain, like, like the average plate, the average fork, the average spoon, the average, you know, you know um, um, uh, soup bowl, and the average stuff you can put in there. There are some things you honestly can't. And, it, and, and, and it is, one, sometimes they're just too big, to be honest with you. They're really not, because they, they design them for standard size things. So it, sometimes they're too big, they're weirdly shaped, because you, know, you have specialty pots, so they're weirdly shaped. And then most of all, sometimes they don't wash. I'm not knocking a dishwasher, but there is something about hand on plate. There's something about scotch Bright and sponge on plate. It's that abrasion. That constant, because in the dishwasher, there's nothing rubbing against it. It's just, just jets of water being spewed out. So you could put something in the dishwasher. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it, but you could put something in the dishwasher, and it will spend the next two, three hours washing it, no, no, running hot water and cold water. So, you know, you got electrics. You got the light bill going up. You got the, the, the water rate going up. And if gas heats your, um, your water, you get the gas, you know, and all that burnt, and the plate is still not clean. My point being is that, from a kid standpoint, got dishwasher, put it in the dishwasher. I shouldn't be having to do this. And I said, I'm never gonna put my kids through that. I am almost 30 years old, and you best believe my kids gonna wash dishes. My perspective changed. I was living in one world as a child. Like Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. So as, as a child, I was thinking in one sense. Now, I'm living on my own, and I ain't got no dishwasher, so thank God. I ain't got no dishwasher. I don't have one. Imagine if all my life I was using dishwasher. Can you imagine the condition of the plates? Can you imagine the condition of the pots? Y'all ever look at somebody's stuff and see food smiling with you? And grease smiling with you? You don't want no food from them. The same way in that natural example I gave, it's the same way in the spiritual. The world, when they are living in sin, they don't understand when they're telling them to go wash plates, to go wash spiritual plates and wash spiritual pots. They don't understand any of that. They're talking about, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. But when they do, come over. When they come over and step into the newness of light, when the blind eyes are open, when their ears are attuned to the spiritual things, all of a sudden, that which made no sense makes perfect sense. Because you never know till you get there. I'm I've proven that over and over and over and over again. I'm, there's so many things that made no sense to me at 12 that all of a sudden now make sense. There are things when I was 15 made no sense. There were things even at 21 and 25, but today, and what's crazy is I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person who I like to be able to explain things well. So I really push and I work hard. And sometimes, you know, now I say to my mom, this is what you should have said to me. And that's why I said to my dad, this is what you would, should have said to me. Because I, that's just my thing. I, I like to be able to explain certain things well. But I will admit, there are just some things I am trying to explain them. Like, you know, I'm just going to leave it alone. Because it is very, very difficult to explain, especially if you're going to start asking me questions. Because I can answer them, but I realize you'll end up even more confused. Because you don't understand. You're just not there. So my mom and dad always used to say to me, listen, I know you don't get it. Just hold on to this. Just hold on to it. Don't throw it away. Keep it in 
the back of your mind. And I promise you when the time come. Do you know how many times I pick up the phone? Whenever moment. He said, you know, I'm so glad you, so glad you. I did because you see today, this is what happened. And because you did that, I knew how to do this. And they were like, yes, and you never like us. And you said we're wicked and we're mean and we're terrible. But you see now today, it's the same thing with the world and us. So I, I say all that just to say, the, when the world goes on, what it goes on, don't, don't. Even Jesus looked into Jerusalem and weep and talk about how they killed the prophets. And guess what? Jesus still went to Jerusalem. He faced their reality. It made him sad, yes, but it never stopped him from going to where he needed to go. Because he understood, I'm about to lay down a foundation that's going to allow these individuals to step over and move from being the people that kill prophets to the people that support them, especially support the real prophets of God. So we shouldn't be surprised. But on one hand, well, we should let the world, if I should say let the world be the world and understand where they're coming from. We should not understand to the point where we change. And that's where the problem comes in. We understand so much and have so much empathy to the point where we change our doctrine. The God-given doctrine. And we come up on the pulpit and we preach things now. We go on our podcast we teach things now, we go on our shows, uh, and we say things now that are more based off of world theories rather than the word of Almighty God. And for those who are very good with speech, they will tie the word with world theories. And they will make it sound like that this is the Bible. And one of the things I've come to realize is that you really have to read the whole Bible in its totality because there's always a little nugget. I remember, I forgot exactly what scripture it was, but prophetess was a couple years ago, was talking to the young people. And she was mentioning something, I think it was, I don't remember exactly what it was, honestly. But it was something um, that everyone thought was not a sin. That honestly, they really thought it was not a sin. And the prophet said, yes, and we found and somewhere buried in the Old Testament, in them first five books, somewhere, I think it might have been Leviticus, one of them, it's buried, like a, it's, it's the one spot, and she pulled it out, and it turned into a fight. And the young people are searching other scriptures to counteract the one scripture. Because they're like, no, no, no. that's how deep the Bible is. Where you can believe you're so right. That's why we have to, every single day, we have to keep on. Keep on. Keep, because you think you're so right. It happens to me. Think I'm so right. And then God just points to one scripture. Yes. And you realize, like, ah. Yes. You realize, oh my gosh, like, I, I got to fix this. I thought I was good, but there's some more work to do. Some more sanding to do. Some more building to do. Some things got to be removed or some things need to be added, whatever it might be. My point being is that they go in and they pick particular scriptures and try to twist them, whether add or take away or completely alter, to match them up with world theories so that they can come on a pulpit and say to you and I, this is what you should do with your life. And what we're now we're seeing is validation through world theories. So all different things that are happening around us, we're seeing now, people are saying now, you should step in this line, and this lines up with the word of God. And we now, as, 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 as Christians now, not examining anything. Grab onto it hook, line, and sinker. Don't ask God no question. Don't go back to his word. Don't look at anything. And we believe that because we have a crowd of people chanting us on, or you realize that people are, quote-unquote, like-minded as us, we believe that everything is all right and it's all good. And we're not realizing that we have now grabbed onto carnality, and that carnality is putting us back at enmity with God. 
Remember, when we come into newness of life, we have left enmity with God, and now we're at enmity with the world. That's the truth. As I get older in in Christ, I start to realize more and more and more, and 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 now I understand why, quote-unquote, Christianity can be, and I put it in quotes, difficult to live. Because human beings, we don't like to pick a side. And what you start to realize as you get older and older in Christ, you do have to pick a side. You try to be diplomatic as much as possible. Try to not make anybody upset. Try to, I mean, I'm, I, listen, I'm one of those people, I, li- I like to keep everything cool. You're, you're on the right side, I'm cool with you. You're on the left side, I'm cool with you. You're up the middle, I'm cool with you. I, try to, I let everybody try to have their, their thing, but there comes a point in time when I'm like, ay, ay, ay. ay. Because this is the thing. I face the reality that most people, once they have chosen their side, they are sticking with it. And they're not giving any more allowance for another side or another perspective. So when we all try to be diplomatic as much and much as possible, we find ourselves boxed in immediately. Because everybody's not saying, all right, we understand you're trying to be diplomatic. I'm going to leave you alone. They're not doing that. They're saying that you have to change. So now we are finding ourselves having to more and more, little by little, pick a side. And when we decide to pick a side, whatever side we choose, as Christians, it's, in, it's imperative to our Christian living, literally imperative to our ticket to go to heaven, that whatever side we choose, it is based on the purpose, the true purpose of Christianity. What is that purpose? That purpose is to reconcile people with God. That's the purpose. It's 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 the purpose of Christianity is to put us back in relationship with God. The purpose of Christianity is all about denying self and picking up God. Uh, We don't seek, you see, you know, we don't come to God and say, No, God, you know, I know who I am. I found myself, and now I'm serving you. No. We come to God saying, God, I come to serve you, and I will find myself in you. I'm going to say that again. We don't come to God saying, I found myself, I know who I am, and now I'm going to serve you. We come to God and we say, I am going to serve you, and I'm going to find myself in you. So no longer is it my definition, it's God's definition. That's why we, uh, uh, um, um, sin bothers us. Why? Because in our natural state, in our natural sinful state, typically it wouldn't. Maybe your conscience, maybe. But typically it wouldn't bother you because you weren't trying to live or I wasn't trying to live uh, to a certain standard. I wasn't trying to improve. But now <laughs> that I've come into Christ... And God is defining who I am, and God is defining who you are. It now these things bother us. Or as we say, the flesh wrestles against the spirit. We wrestle now back and forth trying to do the right thing. Because it's not about what you define as yourself or what I define as myself, and what God defines. It's all about God's definition. It means that our mentality has to drop. It's all about God's mentality. Our feelings have to drop. It's all about God's feelings. Our, the way that we move has to drop. It's all about how God wants us to move. Uh, well, Jesus said that you have to pick up your cross uh, and you have to follow me. You have to deny yourself uh, uh, and put down everything else and pick up your cross and follow me. And these are the things uh, that we are no longer preaching to people. When we talk about salvation, uh, what it means to truly believe. You see, it's not just simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's about I will shed off this old garment uh, and I will put on the new one. And when I put on the new one, it's not what I defined. It's what God has defined. That's the purpose of Christianity. It's to change our very definition from being warmongers and from being sinful people to being sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's to change our name. He said when we go up to heaven, we're getting a new name. It's all about redefinition. Sorry, redefining, not redefinition. Redefining. It's all about redefining our current state. 
We have now left a sinful state and now we are in a life state. We've left the darkness state. Now we're in a light state. We have light. Light not only just without, but also within. You see, in a sinful state, the light was without. The light was without. You, if, the, if, the, if another Christian person wasn't near you, you didn't see no light. But when you become a Christian, the light now is without and it's within. And that's what we, I preach it all the time, but it's true. When we step inside of a room and people trying to figure out why the room changed. Why is it when I'm around you, I feel better? Why is it when I talk to you, something feels different? It's because you don't just have light without, you have light within. Your definition has changed. And when your definition has changed and you go around people with the old definition, they recognize the new definition. If any man be in Christ, he is a new, Christ, new, a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's the purpose of Christianity. It's all about redefining who we are. When I was born, I was Samuel Nathan. When I, when I get saved, no, God said, all right, now you're a different Samuel Nathan. Right in that moment. You're different. I change you. I allow you to see things differently. You will develop new senses. Don't look at me like I'm crazy because one thing I've realized, even if you ain't got no Holy Ghost, when the atmosphere ain't right, you know. You might not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but you still have the Holy Spirit that you receive in the day of salvation. Or when you step into a place and it's spiritually wrong, you know. We change. And, now, and then the, 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 the difficult part now, if we should put it that way, or the part that we're striving to do is to stay changed. Is to stay changed. Stay believing. believing. Stay trusting. Yeah. Growing from perfection unto perfection. And many times, to go from perfection unto perfection, you have to do that journey alone. When Jesus went to die, he was alone. We love to talk about how we feel so alone. When Jesus went to die, nobody was there with him. Mary wasn't there. All his disciples were gone. It was all strangers and people that wanted him dead. When they beat him, there was no friends and family there. When they put the crown of thorns in his head, there was no friends and family there. When they smote him with the reed, there was no friends and family there. And let's be honest. Most of us don't like people seeing us in our worst state. And Jesus had to hang on the cross in front of his mom. We hide, especially us as black people, we hide. You will come, and again, I'm not necessarily knocking you forward, I'm just telling you what we do. We don't like to show weakness. We just don't. This is, this is, this is, especially Caribbeans, we are suspicious people. We are suspicious until it scratch. I mean, we are, su we are suspicious. <laughs> we say yes for peace sake. But when you walk, we're like. <laughs> we don't like to show weakness. We will come outside and everyone believe with the baddest person and then go home and as soon as we get home you drop down yes. not knocking us for it i'm just showing you our attitude and how we like to do things we don't like doing that yet jesus yet jesus had to hang on a cross bleeding dying in his worst state in front of his mother can you imagine the shame? Knowing full well that to save the world, he had to break the heart of his mom. Because it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, that when he became a, 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 a minister of the gospel, that all of a sudden his family ties just died. No, that was still there. What mom wants to see that? 
Yet people losing their minds over people in a casket, much less watching them literally die. But Jesus didn't care about all that. He understood this journey was alone. And he went through that journey alone. So that way we can have support when we are alone. Because the truth, one thing I've come to realize, I'm never alone. I might be alone in the natural. I might be alone when it comes to people. But almighty God is with me. He is always with me. And when tomorrow comes, I'm going to rise. Where no clouds can darken the sky. Because my God is with me. Always going to be with me. So even me, even when I feel alone, I recognize I am not alone. Talk about the purpose of Christianity. When you are reconciled with God, you are no longer alone. God is with you. God is with me. But again, these are things that we're not preaching from the pulpit anymore. It is a lot easier to teach theories, social theories. Theories about how we, one race interacts with another. Theories about how one social class interacts with another. And here's the thing. It's not that there's anything wrong with the theory per se. That's not what we're talking about today. But one thing you cannot do is that you cannot take those theories and make them the foundation upon which you stand. And what churches are doing today is that they are taking those theories and they're making them the foundation upon which they stand. And I'm, Now this one, no one's going to like. But it's have to say because it's true. We keep on saying, oh, again, I'm not talking against Black Lives Matter. I'm not talking against it. But people claim that if Jesus was alive today, that Jesus would be in the protest with Black Lives Matter. That's a lie. And I'm going to tell you why. The, his own people, think about historically now. The Jews were oppressed by the Romans. Jesus came down and saw how they were oppressed by the Romans. And Jesus never called one angel to go and wipe out the Romans for them. So if Jesus is not doing that for his own people. Remember the Bible said he came unto his own and his own knew his own. He came unto his own. The Jewish people are God's. So, uh, I mean, God's meaning G-O-D apostrophe S. They're God's people. They're, they belong to God, right? So I'm thinking to myself, if Jesus didn't wipe out the Romans for his people, and don't forget, you know, they had the zealots, Barabbas, remember? They were, they were fighting the Romans. Jesus, if, if Jesus said, all right, everybody, two arms, oh, all of Israel, all of Israel would have risen up behind him. If Jesus said, don't worry about it, I'm going to call fire down from heaven. And all Jesus has to say, come on now. And everybody from child to adult would grab a weapon and they would follow Jesus into battle. But he never did that. Do you know what he came down and said? I said, he said, I come to preach the kingdom of God. That's his purpose. So when people mention protests of any type, I'm just mentioning that one because that was the most recent one I heard. When people mention protests of any type, I'm like, no, Jesus wouldn't be in there talking about Black Lives Matter. He would be in there talking about, hey, turn to Jesus. Turn to God. Repent. That's what he did when he was down here. He taught repent. Because Jesus knows this. And this is, again, the purpose of Christianity. He knows if I make the world better, but the heart of man doesn't change, the world gets worse. Racism and prejudice is about the heart of somebody. It's not, and, and that's the reason why for all the laws that we have in the books, and they're trying to put on more, somehow, some way, somebody still finds a way to be racist and prejudiced and get away with it. Because it's not about the laws. It's about the condition of the heart. And that's why, whether they are racist, prejudiced, yes or no, I preach Jesus so that Jesus can change their heart and they can drop the racism and drop the prejudice. I said last week, give them Jesus. Because it's the purpose of Christianity. We do, I said it once, I'm going to preach on it one more time. We are not here to make the world a better place. We're not here for that. 
Jesus came down and he, he didn't do that. We are here to be saved. A byproduct of being saved is that the world gets better. We don't come, we don't go out there to make the world better. We go out there to preach Jesus. And as Jesus moves through his people, as Jesus goes through the land, then the world gets better because the world gains a conscience. When you got Jesus reigning, the world has a conscience. When you got Jesus as number one, the world says, wait, I would do this, but I'm not going to do this because the fear of God holds them from doing something wrong. The purpose of Christianity is to teach the beginning of wisdom, which is the fear of God. I'm not out here trying to make the world a better place, but a byproduct, meaning a result, an unintended result of more Christianity is a better world. Because God requires us to be better. So if we're getting better and other people are getting better, what does that mean? The whole world is getting better. The Bible said that we are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor, if it loses its, if it loses its ability, wherewith shall the earth be salted? And let me clarify what that meant. You see, back in those days, you didn't have refrigerators. You didn't have ice like that. So to keep certain things a long time, you had to salt it. You ever have salt fish? That's what they do. They salt the fish so it can keep. And when you want to eat it, you put it in the pot of boiling water. And you boil out the salt. And sometimes you have to do it two and three and four and five times to, to get the salt out of it. But the bottom line is uh, the salt is a preservative. So if the salt is not there, the meat will go to rotten. Because you see germs, bacteria, viruses, they don't like salt. Salt kills them. So when we are now, the earth living in sin, living in its trespasses, it, is, has, it has bacteria, it has viruses. I'm talking about on a spiritual level now. They have all kinds of issues. But when we are down here as the salt of the earth, we preserve the earth. We preserve the earth. We preserve the earth. I don't care how many laws they put on the books. Without God, somebody go find a way to get around them. And as a matter of fact, we as Christians do the same thing too. Find ways to get around the laws of the books. Find the loopholes and go right through them. Christianity is not about, excuse me, Christianity is not about making a better world. It's about bringing lost souls to Christ. Because we all know we're just pilgrims here anyways. We're just passing through. And, le and listen to me. It's only because it is, it's only because the Bible uses parables to make big concepts and complicated concepts simple. Let me break it down even more for you. It's not even just so much that we're pilgrims. John said in Revelation, this whole world is going to burn up. So it's not like we're passing through. We go to heaven and the original earth is still down here. No! He said it won't be the flood this time. It's going to be fire. He said new heaven. New earth. So even the current heaven that we're talking about won't even be there. It'll be a new heaven. And it'll be a new earth. Because, it, because the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. So it's, more, so it's more than even just being pilgrims. We'll be, we're pilgrims in a place that will not last. Listen to me. When you have, when you go on vacation and you go stay in a hotel, you know it's not your house. First of all, most of us know it's not a house because most of us don't have maids and, and, and people and Staff cleaning up. I mean, I love vacation because I never have to make my bed. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> I ain't got to wash no towels. I ain't got to do nothing. I mean, vacation is the time to be lazy. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I tried to leave the room in a decent state because I do feel for those people. 
You know what I mean? Like, because they got to do a whole floor. You try it to be too, so if I, like, if you have all the dirty stuff, you try to put it in one section, put a note there, say, here's all the dirty stuff so that they can quickly grab. They will appreciate you more and they will treat you even better because you're trying to make their lives easy. But my, my point of the matter is, is that when we are in those places, we know they're not our homes. We enjoyed the hotel, we enjoyed the resort, and then we come back home. Now, the reality is that that hotel is still standing. And when you leave, they clear out the whole room and they get it ready for somebody else. Now, okay, that's how it works in the natural. But what God is saying to us is that we are in the hotel called the earth, okay? And it's not, you're not here to stay. You're not here at all. And I'm here to sustain you. I am the maid helping you clean up. I'm helping you. I am the staff uh, uh, washing the clothes and helping you do different things, showing you how to live, showing you how you can be better. But when you leave, when the rapture comes or in death, when you leave the hotel, understand I get a wrecking ball. I have a wrecking ball outside the hotel called Earth. And when the time is right, I'm knocking it down. That's why the Bible says, what does it profit the whole world? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Because the world is going to be destroyed. See, these are things we don't preach. These are things we don't preach because they are controversial. But it's not my word, it's God's word. When the end time comes. You see, everybody keeps talking about end time. <laughs> and, and look, it's, it's a good focus to have because we all should want that when death close our eyes and when the rapture comes, our focus should be, I'm going to make it in. So don't get me wrong. Don't shift your focus. Keep your focus. I should keep my focus on that. However, when you do read Revelation and you read about the lion and you read about the dragon and you read about from one end to the other, and you read about the kingdoms that come up against, up against Israel. And you read about the Red Army. And the whole, and you read from top to bottom. The one thing that becomes very clear to me is that this whole earth down here, that I am working so many hours to put some cash in my pocket so I can take care of my bills and handle myself and do what I need to do so I can have a family one day and put all the things together. All of that is going to burn up. I said, God, you know what? Since they're going to burn up, listen, I'm not saying I'm ambitious. I'm going to keep my ambition. I'm going to push hard. I'm going to do it. Because while I'm down here, I still got to do what I got to do. God is not saying you don't. You stop. But I refuse to put my faith. That's the point. I refuse to make my foundation be this world down here. Because at the end of the day, it going to burn up. It going to burn up. So I refuse to stress myself out. It's better for me to stress over the sin in my life than to stress about this world. Because it's not the world that's going to stop me. It's the sin that's in my life. Better to stress over that. Work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. That's what uh, you, you want to put your body as a living sacrifice, uh, holy and acceptable before God. Uh, that should be our focus. Because they're going to burn up anyways. Again, sounds controversial, but that's literally what Revelation says. Just look at what was the Revelation, is it 21 or 22? The first verse, I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. Even if you don't want to read all of that, just that portion alone, he said it passed away. So even if you don't know how it passed away, the bottom line is when something passed away, it means it did. When they say the person in the casket pass away, they dead. It's over. That's what the Bible says. And so I realized, I'm like, wait a minute. What am I, what am I overly stressing myself out for? Because yes, progress must be made. You got to do what you got to do down here. And God helps to edify us through progress down here. Because God knows we need to see something. We need to touch something. We need to, you know, we, 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 we still need that. Yes, we believe by faith and what we cannot see, we cannot touch, we cannot hear. But we still need it to manifest. So God uses the natural things down here to help to edify us. To help us to move forward. To help us to trust him more. To love him more. To believe in him more. Because we realize if I believe for the small thing and I get something, I can believe for a bigger thing and get something else. And, and you learn how to, the, the, the progress down here teaches you when God says yes, when God says no, when God says 
weight. Uh, you learn that through the constant progress uh, of living on the earth. So it serves a good purpose. Uh, it served, the earth serves a very good purpose for the Christian believer. But this ain't it. And the crazy part is, not even the world can have this. So Will Pilgrim's passing through. <laughs> they claim the world for themselves. That's fair. I understand. That's all they know. But in the end, according to the scripture, they're not going to have it either. The purpose of Christianity is about restoring the bond between us and God. It's not about social theory and bringing social theory to preach in the church. So that way people have to change their Christian living to match the theory. This is what Paul talks about, people with itching ears. Listen to me. Again, another controversial thing, but it's true. And it has to be said now for real. Not something I necessarily want to say, but it's true. If someone comes to me and you say to me, that the reason why I love my church is because of social justice. I don't want to talk to you. And it's not because social justice is not important. I'm a black man. Of course social justice is important. But I want to hear what is the spiritual foundation. If all I'm coming to church is for social justice, I'm very, very sorry. I need spiritual edification. There will always be a social justice cause. Always will be there. Martin Luther King came. We have the, the Civil Rights Act. We have the Voters Rights Act. And we still got problems. Yeah. To the point where, let's be honest, even we as black people, we put down the dark-skinned black people and lift up the light-skinned black people. Yes, we do it. I've come to realize that for some ladies, may God help them. When they are dark skinned, my God, the whole world, including their own black people, treat them bad. The light skinned one can never do nothing wrong. But the dark skinned one is the most wicked one in the world. They must do the work. And that's among black people. So even with on ourselves, we, there, are, there are areas for improvement culturally. Even with all the progress that we have made, there's still a problem. Let me tell you something right now. I, I, and I pray to God that it has changed, and I, and I think it's beginning to change now, so I thank God for this. But when I was growing up, it, if you are a black person and you're a nerd, your own black people never let you live it down. They make fun of you from morning till night. They don't value your intelligence. Today, I'm not going to lie, I have seen a significant improvement. I thank God for that. When I hear about um, an entire class of kids, they're all going to, you know, Ivy League schools. And so I'm like, all right. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. At least we're starting to wake up and realize we need to be smart. Because if we're not smart, we'll always work the lowest job known to mankind. My point is being that if I'm putting my trust and my foundation in social justice, that I'm going to drive myself crazy. Because there's always something. Because men and women are forever wicked. If I am struggling with my own wickedness, and I'm calling myself a Christian, much less the unsafe person. Constant wickedness. Who is telling people that you see no you 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 go down to the subway platform and you're just chilling? Why are you pulling out a knife to go slash somebody? And even on that same topic, when it comes to social justice, a, a good number they say, they say stop Asian hate. That's a good thing. Yes, I don't I don't want Asian people. Asian people, we should see them as our brothers and sisters. Yes, absolutely, hallelujah. I mean, come on. So I'm all for it. But the reality is I have seen plenty of black people attack the Asian people. Yet we as black people claim that white people is attacking us. So black people attacking Asians. White people attacking us. What's my point? The social justice cause, if you make that your foundation. I'm not saying it shouldn't be important to you. I'm showing you when you make it, when we as Christians take that and put that into the pulpit. It doesn't make the 
world better. Oh, Samuel, Martin Luther King. When people t- Martin Luther King was a real man of God. He was, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it's, it's true because I have never, I have not seen a Martin Luther King or someone similar to him since he died. None of these black leaders, I don't care who they are, they have not done what Martin Luther King. Because Martin Luther King put his knees down to knee city. He didn't come up uh, just trying to sound good. He said, I want everybody to sit down at the table of brotherhood. That's what, and you want to know something? That's why we have a result. Because when God decides to move in a man or a woman, you get results. There are fe- and that was at a time where nobody in Congress really wanted to sign the Voters' Rights Act. And they didn't want to sign the Civil Rights Act. But my God, because a true man of God, Reverend Martin Luther King, put aside all the ism and the schism and the level of nonsense. And he went and you see what he did was he said, I'm gonna grab the church people. He said, We're gonna put ourselves together. I'm teaching you something here. We talk about social justice. This is what Martin Luther King did. He said, if we look raggedy and, and taggedy, if there's such a word, raggedy and, and beat up and mash up and all that, there's no empathy for us. But he said, put your suit on. Because you see, in them times, when those white people saw that black people that looked just like them in terms of their clothes was getting beat up and dogs were on them and water was on them and said no 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 we can't be like this and we got laws in the books but that happened because Martin Luther King made his foundation Jesus Christ he did it because Jesus sent him just like how Moses was sent to bring out the Jewish people from Egypt but we take all of that now and we throw it in as the foundation of our Christianity social theories I'm not going to name all of them we don't, at this ministry we don't teach them because at the end of the day what does it profit you? I'm not saying you can't necessarily learn but what does it profit you? also it's a theory this ain't no theory see this book right here? this ain't no theory everybody else is a theory everybody else is a theory and they have some evidence to support them and some evidence to go against them. This book right here is reality. This book is 100% true. Whether they want to believe it, yes or no, it's 100% true. So why am I going to pick up the theory and put down the truth? If this is the truth now, why am I going to put that down and pick up a theory that has some truth but not all truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. So when Jesus was down here, he wasn't doing no social justice. He was preaching the kingdom of God because he knows that men's heart will begin to, will begin to become warm and alive when they accept him. And whatever issue they were dealing with or whatever thing they were moving in the direction of, they will begin to change. And even if they don't completely change, because let's be real, some of us, we're still struggling with certain sins today. We are. Some of us have been saved for a long time. We're still struggling with the same sins since day one. Yes, we are. But there's a difference. Because we are in God, even though, yes, we should stop doing that sin, we don't go as deep into that sin. There's some people, like for example, they, 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 they would like to drink or whatever, but they will, they will never get to the point of, as they say, drunk. They, they refuse to do it. There is a line. Now, in all seriousness, if you, if you don't have to drink, don't drink. But the reality, but regardless, like, no, there, there's a line. So even in Christendom, when we're struggling with our sins and trying to do better, there is still a line that most of us will not cross. Now, we shouldn't be even close to the line. We shouldn't be there at all. And that's the truth. I'm just showing you what Christianity allows even us who are struggling with sin and falling short of the glory of God. How even we, if we were unsaved, we would have run into it. 
But because we are still saved, and even sometimes when we're about to do it, God arrests us on the spot. All of a sudden, you get stomach sick. And you don't want to do it anymore. You're like, I'm just going to go home. And whatever you are planning to do, it just, you just, that's, that's what God does. Because God knows if you try to do it on your own, you're going to struggle. If you try to make that change, because you see, a lot of people, you have to recognize that you need to change. If people don't recognize that they need to change, they're never going to change. I don't care how much you talk to them, how much you preach to them, how much you counsel with them, give them advice. If they don't want to change, they will never change. So God gives, uh, again, uh, reconciling us with God uh, and redefining us. He gives us the opportunity to change. And as we begin to change, we start to do better. And as we start to do better, the world gets better. But we cannot take social theory and make them the basis upon the reason why we want to attend the church. We should be looking for a spirit-filled church where you hear the truth, you experience the flow of God's power. You want to be, when you, 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 you try the spirit, find out if it's the spirit of God. I could care less if they don't like me. Oh, don't get me wrong, it would make it easier if they do. We can't, we can't deny that. It'd make it easier. If they do like me, it makes it a lot easier. But I refuse to run into a place that's telling me the type of things that, yes, my mind likes to hear. And I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. But then when it comes to the spiritual section, it's completely dead. And now I must change my Christian walk, not to become more holy, but to do social theory. Get out of my face. Get out. Nothing angers me more than that. Put Jesus in front of me. Tell me do better because Jesus says do better. But don't you dare bring up any social theory. No psychology theory. No sociology theory. And try to put it as higher than the word of God. Get out of my face. Because you want to know something is all going to pass away. The only thing that will remain is God's word. That's what he says. My word remains. All the theories. And for the, for the record, these theories are constantly changing. New evidence, new change. They said when iPhone, when iPhone first came out and you were tapping the glass, Steve Ballmer said, that is the stupidest thing for you to be um, tapping glass to type, and it will never catch on. Oh, yeah? Everybody hold their phone. Everybody hold their phone. And, and a glass. Isn't it glass you're typing on? Anybody got an iPad? Isn't it glass? Glass we're typing on now. They told us, no, 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 you need buttons. It's getting to the point where you can't even find devices with buttons. They got like three. I remember the sidekick, the Blackberry. They all had buttons, a whole bunch of, like a whole keyboard and the whole thing. And today, we are typing. We are drawing on glass. We play games on our phone on glass. Yet Steve Ballmer, who was one of the top executives at Microsoft, so he knows what he's talking about. He understands technology. And he said this will never, ever, 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 ever catch on. Yet years down the road, all of us is using glass. Everything is through glass to the point where when we work remote, it's glass. Camera, glass. Computer, glass. Phone, glass. iPad, tablet, glass. Even the watch, oh, look at the watch, it's glass. It's constantly changing. Sometimes you think something won't take off, and it does. So theories are constantly changing. All the time they're shifting and changing. But God said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Stand with me. God said, I am the same today, 
the same tomorrow, the same yesterday. I don't change. I don't change. You know why? Because I'm perfect. You know why? Because I am perfect. You know why? Because Jesus is the almighty God. And therefore, when we come unto him, we grow from perfection unto perfection. There ain't no social theory. We don't do social theory. You can learn about it. I'm not against that. There's some good information in there. But it cannot become the foundation upon which you believe. And it cannot become the validation for God in your life. I will not make any type of social justice thing be the validation of God in my life. Because, it, again, another controversial statement, but it's true. It would be better for me. This is how serious it is to walk with God. It would be better for me to be a slave and have God than to be as rich as um, Jeff Bezos and don't have him. It's better for me to be down in the mud, treated like garbage, and have Jesus than it is to be treated like a king and don't have him. And that's what, and you know something? These things actually did come up when Jesus was there because the Jews were like, when are you going to restore the kingdom of David? When are you, when are you going to restore? When are you, when, when are you going? And Jesus is like, my kingdom is not of this world. Yeah. You're asking me, you're so concerned with earthly things that are going to pass away anyway. Yeah. You, you look at the lilies of the valley. They, 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 neither, they neither toil nor spin. Look at the fowls of the air, you know. And God provides for them. So and Jesus is like, you, you're, you're losing your mind over everything down here. If I take a match to this thing right now, it burns up. <laughs> I mean, come on. All this stuff, is, it can die. And Jesus is like, and then after all that dies, where's your soul going to go? Where's your soul going to go? So let me help you with your soul. I'm rectifying your soul. Reconnecting back your soul with God. What a difference does it make? And look, and if, and if you don't believe me, for us as black people, we can use the Bible as an example in this regard. The Israelites end up with Israel, correct? And they get King David, correct? And they get King Solomon, correct? And guess what? They fall into sin. And what happened? The Babylonians come. To the point where now we as Koreans talk about, at the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, when the wicked carry us away. We start to sing those kind of songs. Because the Israelites fell into sin and therefore the Babylonians take them away. What, a, what am I missing? What are you saying? What I'm saying is that if we as black people now, saying that we want this and we want that, if our hearts don't change, we will get it and lose it. People who win the lottery end up broke most of the time. And it's so good. How do you win the lottery? They get hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, anybody got still student loans here? I need to pay up my student loans. I could use some help. If you don't know what to do with it, give me some. I could use some help. I mean, come on. And you go spend off all the money and end up broke. You know why? Because their mindset and their heart. They didn't know how to. You see, you see people who have discipline. Understand, you see all that lot of money? I don't spend one penny of it. Wait for taxes to get pulled out first. Then you reassess, you get a financial advisor, you reassess everything. And then you take money and turn it into an asset. You don't start buying up a whole bunch of stuff now. You take money, you buy stocks, you buy cryptocurrency, you, 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 you buy your... Um, um, the, uh, you buy different other currencies. You, you, keep, you keep on investing. You, maybe, you might, maybe you might buy a property now. And you, you invest. You become a part of a venture capital. Like you find different ways to turn your money from cash into an asset. And most importantly, pay off your debt. People are win the lottery. Don't pay off no debt. Lose the money. End up in double debt. How would that make any sense? Because the heart and the mind don't change. I said to us as black people, 
So when, if we say we, were, say we got everything, no more racism, that'd be great. No more prejudice, that'd be great. If we don't activate ourselves, we still remain down in the dumps. If we don't do better, we're still down there. Because I tell people all the time, and, and, this, and, this is, and this is why, again, the purpose of Christianity, it teaches you to control what you can control and leave everybody else alone. Christianity says to you, because while you're worrying about her, your soul is slipping. She gone to heaven, you gone to hell. Oh, Jesus. See, these are the things we don't preach in church no more so concerned about the state of this world and you, we are bringing ourselves down and then when we come in front of God we say but I did prophesy in your name and I did preach in your name and I did heal in your name and he's going to say depart from me I know you not we don't talk about this stuff that's the purpose of Christianity rectify the human condition redefine who we are instead we're taking because we're trying to be relevant. Jesus is not about relevance. He's about truth. Some days the truth is very, very relevant. Other days it is not. You know why? Because human beings, we, we go to and fro with our feelings. When danger, and if you don't believe me, all of you parents that have unsaved kids, don't be fooled. When danger show up, they know how to call the name of Jesus. If they cannot call you, they call Jesus, and they mean it. In that one moment, they mean it with every fiber. And, they're being, and that's how I look upon them and say, I don't want to hear nothing from any one of you. I don't want to hear you tell me about anything. Because when the time comes, you drop all your falsehoods, and you pick up the truth, and you call him, and they get deliverance. <laughs> Found the purpose of Christianity. Reconcile us back with God. That's what it's all about. It's about to put us, take away the enmity. And the, talk about the carnality and the carnal minds. And the, it's not subject to the law of God, but we are. We are now no longer subject to the law of the world. We're now subject. I want to say the law of the world. We're talking about the law of sin and death. That's what we're talking about. Not the law of the world in terms of the actual, like the constitution and the laws. I'm not saying that now. Let me clarify. Because people just take your words and run with it. So, <laughs> you, we are subject to the law of God. And every day we are struggling, wrestling to and fro, back and forth. That's why we wrestle. We wrestle because we're trying to keep the relationship, trying to keep and preserve that which God has given us, the blessing. And if, and if, you've, if you've attained certain levels in God, you, you, you fight even more because you, you don't want to slip. Because it's very easy to slip and end up at the bottom. Very hard just to move up to, to the next level. I mean, you, you, you push so hard to get to the next level, but in no time you're back to level zero. So you, 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 you push because, because it's all about the relationship. It's all about the relationship. And, and you, say, you get to the point where you're not even doing it for you no more. Like, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like, God, I'm doing this for you because I love you so much. Uh, because I know what you've done for me. Uh, and even though I don't want to do it uh, and I don't feel like doing it, I'm going to do it because you ask me to do it. Uh, I tell people all the time, if I don't have to be up here, I'm not going to be up here. But I face the reality. God asks me to come up here and I come up here and I see the benefit of it. Uh, I put past, I put myself to the side uh, and I say, God, you gave me a mouth uh, and I know how to talk. So God, I'm going to use my mouth and I'm going to talk about you and I'm going to allow you to use me. I ain't perfect. That's why I, pre that's why I pray all the time to God. What you have to say to me and your people, it's not me separated from you. I'm just being used as a vessel to speak unto you. But it's not me being separated from you. As I am, as God tells me, I learn, I spew out, you learn. We all learn together because we all got to grow together. Ain't nobody higher than the other. We're all just sinners saved by grace. That's it. We're all sinners living in trespasses and sin. We're saved by grace and that's what we can call ourselves saints. We can call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High God. So put aside the theories, man. Be careful what you're doing up on the social media and what you're taking in. Because these world theories are not going to help your Christianity. I don't care how well they affect the world. The world is doing their business. 
you do your business, which is God's business. All that fire you got for everybody that is racist and prejudiced against you. Come into the house of God and bring it. Come on. Bring that fire over here. We'll tell you what to do with it. Show you how Jesus took the fire that was in Peter. The fire that was in Peter that cut off the ear of the servant. Took that fire and redirected it to be a sunbeam for him. Are you smart like Paul? Bring the smartness over here. Let us tell you what to do with it. Let us show you how God will turn your intelligence and make you realize it's nothing but dung. It's nothing but a loss compared to the excellence here of Jesus Christ. Bring your intelligence and let God show you what he can do to you and how you can be somebody who affects the entire world. For Jesus. For his purpose. For almighty God. You got all that. You, you, oh, you got emotion? You got hurt? Come to the altar. There is a river. That flows. From deep within. There is a fountain. That cleanses the soul from sin. Come to this water. There is a vast supply. There is a river. That never shall run dry. You got issues, you got problems? Bring them to the altar, put them down there. You don't like how the world treats you? Let me give you a solution. Come to Jesus. Jesus will show you how to go through the water. Jesus will show you how to go to the fire. He will show you how to go through the flood because Jesus went through it too. You think Jesus never experienced racism? The Romans didn't like the Jews and Jesus was a Jew. He went through it, but yet uh, he said, my eyes. He kept his eyes up, focused on what God sent him to do. He said he set his eyes to Jerusalem. He didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't join in with the whole fighting because Jesus is like, we're going to do all this. ain't going to mean nothing anyways. This don't mean nothing anyways. But for sure, I promise you this. If I bring salvation, it will change the course of the world. And it will allow you and me to come into salvation so that one day we can go to heaven. It's not about social theory. And now we're confusing the church. It's not even about the world now. This is about the church confusing the church and trying to get people to just latch on to this thing and they must do everything that you say when you preach the truth let me tell you something about truth I'm closing but let me tell you something about truth when you preach the truth you say the truth and you're done with it if somebody want to come them come if them don't want to come they don't want to come that's what the Bible says the truth shall set you free if you don't want to hear what I have to say, that's for your problem. That's yours. Your problem. My job is to speak the truth and leave you alone. Well, you, 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 in the Caribbean, sometimes we say, you say your peace. Say, say your peace and done. We're done. When, when grandma, when my dad's mom was a little bit younger, a little, there's a little bit more strength, and she get upset, she say her peace. And then she said, I'm done. And start singing and walk away. Whether I want to take it, yes or no. She say her peace and start to sing the songs of Zion. What's the point? She spoke her truth and she done. If you want to take it, take it. Because she said she's not in for no fighting and back and forth with you. She said, I'm going to speak the truth and leave it alone. You see, when you're not speaking truth, you have to force people. When you're not speaking the truth, you got to force people to do exactly what I tell you to do. you got to think exactly like how I tell you to think. you got to, I mean, for crying out loud, come on, parents. You've been telling your kids the truth for a long time, and they don't listen to you, and them drop on their face, and you watch them drop on their face and get back up again. If that's what you do with your children, sometimes you got to let them fall. Let them run into the truth for themselves. So that should tell you, when you know the truth, there's a certain level of ease that you feel. 
Because you spoke the truth and it's over and it's done with. Two plus two is four. Don't, but when people don't speak the truth and they're mixing the truth with lies, now they got to pressure you because they know if you examine it. See, that, that's what a con man does and a con woman does. Con artists uh, constantly pressuring it. Whatever, or like when, yeah, or like the salesperson, you know what I mean? They go, Brrr. come, come, come now, deal soon up, deal soon up, deal soon up. I'm like, I would like the details, please. Oh, I can't tell you that. Why can't you tell me that? <laughs> Next thing you know, you sign, and like I always say to people, you sign your life away. Sign your life away. <laughs> to what you don't know. Because they rush into it, but someone who's truthful lays everything out. And when they know it's good and they know it's good for you, they, they say, this is the side. They answer all of your questions. They make sure you feel comfortable. When I'm dealing with my clients, that's like what I do. Some, this is, let's go through the stuff. Do you understand this? Are you sure? Some of my coworkers are like, why are you going through this? I'm like, no, I want them to understand what we're about to do and what it takes because when the tire hits the road, I don't want nobody coming and asking me no questions. I must be able to say, I put it in an email. We recorded the conversation. We had this conversation. And it puts, you know what it does? It builds trust. When, you, when Jesus preached the truth, he built trust. That's the reason why his disciples, even after he died and they ran away, they still came back because they trusted him. The women went to his burial because they trusted him. Jesus built trust. And, that, and listen, trust is hard to build. So when you, when you use theory... And you use lies, or you mix up the world's theory, and it, some of those social theories are lies. They're lies because compared to Jesus Christ, they're lies. So when you mix it up with Jesus Christ now, yes, you fill up the place quick. But it's all for sure. But when you build trust, when a ministry builds trust, people come. And they come for real, and they stay. And, they're hard, and they become invested because, you see, when, when, you, when, when there's trust between two people, you both become investors. Yeah. Think about husband and wife. You, 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 you become investors. I watch it. Any good couple, when I look at how they operate, they are investing. When they're going to go buy a house, it's an investment. When they're going to go buy a car, it's an investment. When they're putting aside for the college fund, it's an investment. When they're deciding who's going to sign for the FAFSA loan, it's an investment. When they're paying for the football and the soccer and the basketball and the dance and the singing and the shows, and all, all of that is an investment. And they do it together because they have built trust in one another. Because they are speaking truth to each other. So in the natural, so in the spiritual, Jesus built trust with us. And when we go through our dark times, he shows up and builds trust with us. Says, you must trust me. And when he tells us to improve and we improve and we realize that we're actually better, because somebody look at you and be like, wait a minute, you didn't act like that. Whoa, you knew. And you're like, oh yes, God works. Ain't he good? He builds trust. Because you got to get to the point where you are willing to die for God for real. Because only when you love and you really trust somebody, you die for them. Got to get to that point. That's the point. Purpose of Christianity, we're willing to die for God. Literally die. Give our lives for God. Now, if, it, if it's based off of social theory, it's not going to work. If it's based off of psychology, it's not going to work. Because they constantly keep changing that stuff to be popular. But Jesus remains. Saints, don't, don't, don't trade your purpose. You around this world, don't trade, don't, trade, don't trade the purpose. God is God. If God be God, let him be God. And, and preach truth. Yes, I understand. We all live and we all fall short of the glory of God. We all need to do better. But I tell you this. When you are doing wrong, but you know the truth, you have a higher chance to get better. When you are doing the wrong and you don't know the truth, you stay in the wrong. But when you know the truth... And you preach the truth and you talk the truth, even when you're not even properly living the truth. At some point in time, most of the time, you come over. Because after a while, it's coming out of you. And after a while, the Holy Spirit will convict you to the point where your body will freeze when you're about to do the wrong. 
talking about the purpose of Christianity. Let's hold on to that purpose, saints. Don't let this world and let all those theories out there and what other churches are preaching. Again, I'm not trying to preach against other churches because I just have to talk about it because it's real. It's happening in, in churches all around this country and maybe even around this world. Don't let go of God for no social theory. It doesn't work. It will poison your mind and poison your heart. You become knowledgeable. Paul, Paul, because of his knowledge, was killing Christians. That's what these theories will push you to do. Their knowledge will push you to look at your Christian brother and sister and say, take him or her away, kill them. Paul did it, and that was based off of the knowledge and the education that he had at that time. And it took Jesus to knock him down for him to come to the truth. Without that, Paul would still be trying to kill Christians. And don't forget, he was validated. The the Pharisees gave him permission. So, uh, So in other words, his killings were not considered murder. They were justified. So in them times, what happened now? You fall into those theories? You fall into those theories and make them your foundation? You, they will justify you turning somebody in. They will justify you killing someone. Justify you hurting someone. That's what they will do. And say it's right. And that Jesus would want this to happen. This is how the Antichrist is going to confuse people. Because he's going to have just enough of the truth, but a whole lot of lies. This is how the Antichrist comes through theory. And then, because the Bible said he'll be able to call down fire from heaven, he'll be able to attach theory with a sense of reality. And he will look, because, oh, Elijah did that. He'll look like the truth. He'll sound like the truth. But when you examine him, white sepulchre, dead man bones on the inside. When you actually examine him. But you have to be at the place in God in order to examine him and know. That's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us about this. And that's why we cannot take theories and make them a part of our foundation. Learn about them if you must. Gain some knowledge. Knowledge is good to have. But anytime you gain that knowledge, you go back to the word. Come here, minister. You go back. Just hold this iPad. This iPad represents, come forward. This iPad represents knowledge, theories, science, psychology, history. You go. But when you finish, grab this and put it Put it on your head and make sure you are seeing that knowledge through the prism of the word of God. Because if you only look at this by itself, you will forget God and forget Jesus Christ. You will backslide. You will completely backslide entirely because you're only looking at this. Make sure you're looking at it through the word of almighty God. All right, righteous heavenly father. We thank you, Lord, for this word, for truly teaching us today. We thank you, Jesus, that, Lord, you want to remind us today that the foundation, Lord, that you laid, Lord, the purpose of Christianity, God, is to bring us back to the Father, to reconcile us to the Father, to allow ourselves to be redefined by the Father. Help us, Lord, through this very, very perilous time. As, Lord, from your, from, from your, from your pulpit, Lord, or places that should be your pulpit, many are preaching, Lord, on social theories and are using them, God, and using your word as a validation point. Lord, to move more in the world's vein more than your vein. God, help us, Lord, to be steadfast. Help us, Lord, to be unmovable. Help us, Lord, to always abound, Lord, in your work. To preach your word. Lord, that we are calling sinners, Lord, to Christ. That we are calling saints from perfection unto perfection. 
Though we are calling for those to get baptized with the Holy Ghost. For those to get a deeper relationship with you. Because Lord, when they have a deeper relationship with you, Lord, then Lord, this world will get better. And moreover, Lord, we will be guaranteed our spot, Lord, to be with you in the end. Lord, thank you, Lord, for one more time. Those who are watching around this world, world gun God. We pray, Lord, that they will be blessed, Lord, this week. You keep them in the palm of, of your hand. God, surround our minds. Surround our ears. Surround our hearts. Lord, let us see, Lord, through your eyes. Let us hear with your ears. Lord, let us be careful what we are ingesting, what we are taking in, into our hearts. Lord, help us, Lord, to vet everything, Lord, that comes before us so we can vet it for the truth. Help us, Lord, to hold on to your word that will never perish. Help us, Lord, to hold on to the Holy Spirit, to your Son, and to you, the Father. Thank you, Lord, for doing one more time. As we look to you again, that your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Tune in next week to our faith broadcast. I know this is a little bit lengthy, but God had to speak today. We pray that you have a blessed week in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together. Amen.